All right, so on the left here, I have a Nikon D750. This is my absolute favorite camera Nikon has ever produced. That is until October of last year. And that's when they came out with the Nikon Z6 II. Now, I was reluctant to even consider upgrading my Nikon D750. All of my favorite images, some of my best images I've ever created were created with the Nikon D750. These images you're looking at right now were all created with the Nikon D750 and mostly with the 85 millimeter lens. The question of this video is going to be, is the Nikon Z6 II worthy of upgrading for anyone who is an absolute fanatic like I am of the D750. Well, rather than make you wait, not clickbait style, yeah, yeah it is, but uh, let's take a look. Hey everyone, it's Mike here with Mike McGee Photography. Okay, right out of the gate, I'm gonna let you know, this is not gonna be a bash fest of the D750. I love the D750. I'll show some more images. Here's some images I created with the D750. I think it's a phenomenal tool. I think it's personally the best camera that Nikon's made in the past decade. It fits sort of a sweet spot of price point, bang for the buck, uh, whether you need the larger megapixels or not. Uh, it just has enough features to really create some stunning images without uh, giving you features that you essentially don't need for an extra thousand bucks, like with the D810 or whatever at the time that it came out. So. Now that you know that I truly still love the D750, um, this isn't going to be a bash fest and it's going to just show you some of the features of the Z6 II that really made me jump ship. Now, obviously I'm wearing a, a Z series shirt, so you might consider me a fanboy. I'm not, whatever tool serves the purpose, but um, there are three main areas that I wanted to focus on. A lot of people focus on all the specs of the Z6 II and here's what it does and it has this megapixel and this battery, blah, 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 and they just list it, a laundry list. I really don't care about that. I'm a photographer. I don't upgrade my camera bodies quite often. In fact, I thought about upgrading, upgrading to the DA10 and realized that those larger megapixels meant larger file sizes and I didn't need it. I didn't want it. It was just more computer storage space, just problematic. It would slow things down. It just wasn't needed for me. Now, uh, for you, cool. Um, so instead of focusing on like the laundry list of, of items that work with the Z6 II, I wanted to focus on three things. Three things that really, in comparison to the D750, made me go, huh, maybe I should upgrade. And um, so number one is video. So. I never did any videos before having the Z6 II. Now, if you notice, I'm on YouTube. Well, the reason I'm on YouTube is because this makes it so easy to make videos. Uh, I never did videos before because with the D750, it just isn't really the ideal video shooter. Now, um, if you don't shoot videos, you might think, hey, I'm a photographer, I'm, I'm not a videographer, I don't care about that, and I get it. So we could set that one to the side, but for me, video was kind of a nice add-on bonus at the same price point uh, with shooting all the way up to 4K, you know, 60 frames a second. So I think that works really well for video for the Z6 II. Um, now the other one that was huge for me was the F to Z adapter. Okay, now I was kind of naive when I first started with the Z, with the, excuse me, with the D750 where I have F mount lenses that I don't want to upgrade. This 85 millimeter 1.4 from Nikon is phenomenal. It's the best lens. This combo right here is just my favorite combo. It's, it's phenomenal. Nikon doesn't even have a native Z series 85 millimeter F 1.4 or 1.2. It's on their roadmap. I think it's coming out in 2000, next year, 2022. But um, it's on the roadmap. But uh, the 105 F.4, not even on the roadmap, I don't think. So what's someone to do with some expensive glass that they've invested in? Will it work on the mirrorless series? And the answer is not only yes, but it was. it's phenomenal. I, I think it works because of this small little adapter. I thought, oh, there might be lag in the autofocusing system. It might not seek things out. I've seen reviews that say it's not as good as the Sony. It's not as good. I don't know what they're talking about. I'm a photographer. These are tools that we need to use and I think it works flawlessly. Um, so once I realized the F to Z adapter was 
not only doable, but works very well, then I thought, huh, now I don't have to upgrade all my F-mount lenses right away. Maybe, maybe never. Um, that is a huge cost savings to be able to implement the, the tool that use adaptive lenses and still create stunning images. So um, that was number two on my list of, huh, I might actually upgrade to the Z6 II. Now, the third one is the autofocusing system or just the focusing system, I'll say. Now, the Z, the Z, I'll get this, has such an advanced focusing system in comparison to the D750 that it is really in a class all its own. Um, it is something that I, I think the only way to sort of see the difference is if you're just a steadfast D750 user. Maybe you haven't even seen how the focus system works on the, the Z6 II. I think it would be nice if I could somehow do some sort of side-by-side -side comparison of what it looks like when you're focusing things through the viewfinder of the D750 and through the viewfinder of the Z6 II. Now, Nikon doesn't let you shoot video directly out of the viewfinder on the D750 because it's not technically a mirrorless camera. It needs the mirror to show through the viewfinder. Makes sense. So you can do it through live view. However, my goal is to create sort of a live view viewfinder hybrid so you can see an overlay of where your focus points are because that is one of the biggest limitations of the D750. I love it, but you don't have focus points that go all the way to the edge of the screen. You have focus points that are sort of consolidated into the center and that usually pros like me will want to do back button focusing so you lock focus and then recompose, lock focus and re recompose. And it becomes second nature after a while. However, with the Z6 II, corner to corner, you have focus points. It's it really is, I, I tend to use the word game changer quite a few times, but that really is a game changer in the ability to create those focus points all the way, corner to corner, a model's eye on the left and how it can seek focus as well. It's just a phenomenal tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and change views, show you sort of an in-detailed, in-depth look at the focusing system of both the D750 and the Z6 II. All right, so now I'm actually pulling a live feed directly from the Nikon D750. You can see the specs on the left and on the bottom that shows my settings. The settings really don't matter. I'm just using natural light. That's why the ISO is at 1250, who cares? You know, unfortunately I can't take footage directly from the viewfinder on a D750 because it's not a mirrorless camera. So this will be live view footage, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to overlay the focus points to really sort of reinforce how limited the focus points are on the D750 and how you must get used to locking that back button, usually back button focus on a model's eye and then recomposing. So locking focus and recomposing. And you're constantly going through that motion, which again, becomes second nature and it's something I found quite uh, doable. It's just that you don't have the ability to have focus points going all the way to the edges of the screen. Okay, so unlike the D750, this is the footage directly from the viewfinder of the Z6 II. Now, this is exactly what you see when you're looking through the viewfinder. This is the electronic viewfinder, so I'm able to actually output exactly what is seen when you're holding this to your eye. As I'm scrolling through these focus points, I wanted to do an apples to apples comparison. So I'm still in AFS, I'm in single point focus, and I am manually finding those focus points via the joystick on the back. As I toggle through these, these focus points, you can see I am now able to go corner to corner all the way across the entire frame and I can lock focus. That means less need for locking focus just in the center of the frame like with the D750 and then recomposing. You don't have to lock recompose. So now all you have to do is find your shot, compose it, then find the focus point that you want, select it, lock it, and fire away. This is a really, really big, important detail that is more than just a minor feature upgrade, and that is simply within the AFS single point focus mode. So that's already an upgrade from the previous D750. Now, we're gonna get into the auto eye focus, which 
<laughs> is incredibly more advanced and detailed. And so I thought it would be smart if I go through all of the focusing modes of the Z6 II to just show you a little bit of what it looks like exactly through the viewfinder and exactly what you can expect. All right, so if you're used to the Nikon D750, you're probably wondering, well, how do I change different focus modes and what are they? Well, you just simply have to push the I button on the back of the camera. Once you push the I button, you see this customizable menu system where I customized my focus modes to be on the far right-hand side. And you can see it's designated with the pin button right now and then there's AFS below that. But uh, once you select the pin, let's say, now you get to go through the different focus modes that you have. And now it's going to be set to pinpoint autofocus. Previously, we were on the single point autofocus, but now we're gonna go with pinpoint. All right, so for the pinpoint autofocus, this really isn't one that I use very often since I'm a portrait photographer. I will use pinpoint autofocus if it's going to be for product photography, but for portraiture, I don't really use this. This just allows you to really pinpoint obviously focus in on a selected spot within the frame and it's really ideal for stationary objects subjects that aren't moving let's say it's product photography so you can then slowly it, it takes a little bit of time going through the focus points but you just can finally select that point and you have a grid that overlays all the 273 autofocus points for the z62 Okay, so moving on from the pinpoint autofocus, next up is the single point autofocus. Now, this is the one I already covered in direct comparison with the Nikon D750, so there's no point in going through this again, so I just wanted to show you where it shows up in the menu system. All right, so as we go up the ladder of these focus modes, you may be noticing a pattern. It started with pinpoint, then it goes to single point, now it goes to wide, and then it will get even wider. So wide area autofocus is just a larger square. It's a square box that isn't as small as single point, definitely not as small as pinpoint, and it just allows you to select a larger square to focus on. Now, I do portrait photography, and sometimes when I do a full length, I actually will use wide area autofocus, just select that box Box on a model or client's face and then you're good to go uh, especially if you're at a higher aperture like f8 or something it's not gonna matter there's no depth of field issues there and if you're far enough back to get a full length uh, you're gonna be fine so that's when I use wide area autofocus uh, s Okay, so next up is Wide Area Autofocus L. It's just larger. So just like the Wide Area Autofocus S, which was a square, this is a larger rectangle that mimics the viewfinder's orientation. And it just gives you a larger area to select from if you wanna lock that focus through the joystick that's on the back. Okay, if you've waded through the sort of mundane, straightforward, autofocus points of the Z6 II. Now we're gonna get into some serious Doc Brown, Back to the Future, ridiculously advanced stuff. And this is where it is completely different from the D750. Here we have wide area people. So this is a wide area that you're allowed to select. And as you can see, I'm scrolling through some of the, the larger squares that we saw with the wide area large. And yet, this one will automatically detect faces and importantly, eyes within that red box. So you can see, as I'm scrolling around, when it doesn't detect a face, it's not really gonna seek anything. However, when a set of eyes, or a face in particular, falls within that red square, it's gonna auto-detect that face and lock focus on the eye. Now, this is the kind of stuff that is revolutionary. So when you have auto, eye focus, that's one thing where it could seek out people all throughout the full frame. Now, wide area autofocus for people, this is great if let's say you're a wedding photographer and you want to, you have a group, but you really wanna focus on the couple. They're dancing on the dance floor and there's a bunch of people in the front and a bunch of people in the back. Well, you wanna focus in on just that couple. Well, you can put that red box over your particular couple, fire away, and it's gonna lock focus on their eyes, even if they're moving, even if they're within another larger group of people. That means fewer missed shots and some incredible technology that goes into making this great for portraiture and for shooting people in general. All right, so next up is wide area autofocus for animals. Yes, it does the same thing for animals. So if you have a cat or a dog, I think it's it's strictly related to uh, 
domestic animals like cats and dogs. I doubt it would catch a crocodile's face, but who knows? I don't know. Um, anyway, wide area autofocus for animals works in the same way. So let's say you had a group of animals at a dog park or something, and you really want to focus on your particular dog or cat. Um, then you can just select that red square that goes over your dog, even if there's other animals in the, in the vicinity. And um, the autofocus system will not focus on those pets, it will focus on just your animal. Now, um, there are some pluses and minuses to this. You can see that while I'm doing it, um, it is actually catching the focus of my mannequin. I don't know, maybe she has cat-like eyes or something like that, so it is actually catching her. But uh, I do know it does have some limitations and it's still being developed as we speak. But uh, if you have a shaggy dog that where the eyes might be covered with hair, you'll probably run into some issues. But um, it's really detecting the, the face mapping and and then the eyes for animals as well. All right, so next up we have the auto area autofocus. Basically, this is just letting the camera decide what it thinks should be in focus. It scans the entire viewfinder. It does not have face detection. And as you can see, when I cycle through the focus lock, it will focus on different parts of the image assuming that's what it thinks you want. So honestly, this is one of the few focus modes that I really don't use. It's just too arbitrary. It lets the camera do the work and I like to have a little bit more control over exactly what I'm focusing on. If it's portraiture, I'm gonna have face detection. I'm gonna have single point. I'm gonna use something a little bit more precise. All right, so it's time to head back into that DeLorean. We're gonna hit 88 miles an hour and we are going into the future yet again. We have auto area autofocus with face detection. Not just face detection, but auto eye focus. Now, what makes this so revolutionary, especially for a portrait shooter coming from a Nikon D750, is that it is going to automatically detect faces in the entire viewfinder frame. So before we had that wide area where it would just detect faces within that red box. Now we're going into the entire viewfinder. You're able to select different faces and more importantly, when it maps that face, it will lock eye focus not just any eye focus, but it will show you exactly which eye it's focusing on. Now, if you can see from some of these examples as the computer inside the camera is detecting faces and eyes, it will not only lock that eye focus, but it will then allow you to choose the other eye. So let's say you see that little arrow that you have right to the side of the box. Well, if you'd like to switch to the other eye, you just toggle the joystick with a little tap to the left or a tap to the right, depending upon the eye that's being selected, and you can focus in on that specific eye. Now, I'm going to go ahead and move the camera around because my mannequin stationary, but you can see how it's almost like in Top Gun with a targeting system that's going to target MIGs in the air. This thing is targeting eyes to lock that focus exactly what you would want if you're a portrait shooter like myself. So here we go. As you can see me move the, the camera around, I'm going forward, I'm going back. Um, the yellow box shows that it is tracking, but once I tap my back button focus and lock that in place, then it turns green and I fire away. So I know everything's in focus. This is in the AFS mode. So that will give me that audio feedback as well. With a little beep, it turns green and it will show you everything that's in focus when I'm doing a portrait shoot. It's pretty incredible. It's worthy of its own separate distinction of such a broad leap from the Nikon D750 that I think it's worthy of upgrading your camera system. All right, so we just saw the auto area, auto eye detect, which scans the entire viewfinder for faces and more importantly for eyes. Now, as I mentioned previously, the AFS mode that I had, the single point mode, was one that it would have a box in yellow and once I would tap the back button to lock that focus, it turns green and then I can fire knowing I'm locked on that particular focus point. Now, what happens if we choose AFC, which is continuous focus mode? Now that means we can still have the same area focus mode where the computer is essentially scanning the entire viewfinder for faces and eyes. However, the continuous mode, the AFC mode, is going to be slightly different. Now that means it is going to be updating it's not just tracking, it's updating the focus lock as I'm holding down the back button, which really means it's not only targeting the eyes and faces, it's actually locking focus at the same time. 
This again is pretty amazing. It is just one where I can just fire away knowing I'm locking focus every time, no matter what is happening. So I'm gonna go ahead and move myself to simulate movement of a model in this case. And you can see that eye is not only being tracked, it's also being focus locked the entire time. So every time I hit the shutter, it's a sharp focus that locks it in place. This is different from AFS, which is tracking it, but it's not gonna lock that focus until you actually hit the back button focus lock. Now AFC is going to be tracking it and updating the focus point if you're holding down the back button. This is one of those things that, again, it's such a revolutionary change from, from what I've been accustomed to with the D750 that this alone, these AFS and AFC with auto eye detect is just pretty amazing as a portrait shooter when you're gonna have all these different tools and elements in case a model is running, spinning, walking, walking away from you, walking towards you, you'll now have far more opportunities to have more keepers and less wasted shots simply because you have more tools at your disposal. Okay, so the final auto area autofocus option is for animals that will scan the entire viewfinder for any animals in the screen and will allow you to auto detect their eyes. Um, again, if you're a pet photographer, this might be great, but since I'm a portrait photographer, I truthfully haven't even used this feature, but I could definitely see where for certain types of photography, namely pet photography, this would just be a godsend to be able to update that with AFC and really lock that focus. So there's no real point of me going into it in detail, but I wanted to share one other autofocus option, which is also pretty incredible. Okay, so I'm gonna go back and put this on auto area autofocus for the entire frame with face detection. And I'm gonna go ahead and put this back to AFC, which will continuously track that focus point for me. Now, you may notice at the bottom of the viewfinder, there is something that says, okay. What exactly is that? Well, that's a whole separate thing called subject tracking. That is yet another tool that you'll have to be able to lock focus when a subject is moving either in and out of the frame or moving towards you, what have you. So what you do is on the back of the camera, you push the OK button. Once you push that, a box comes up and it allows you to select your subject. And in this case, it's going to be the mannequin's face. So I'm gonna select the mannequin's face. I'm gonna tap OK again so that it locks that focus and now, as there's movement going on, the camera is automatically tracking this subject. Whether they go in and out of the frame, it's mapped to that face, and it knows that face as opposed to a tree, as opposed to something else, and it's gonna follow that particular subject in and out of the frame. It's, again, pretty remarkable. It's another tool that just makes the autofocus system of the Z6 II completely remarkable to me and something that's worthy, especially for portrait photographers, worthy of a body upgrade. All right, so hopefully that breakdown of the focusing system of the two cameras will give you some greater insight as to how or why I should say I feel the Z6 II is so much more superior than the D750 in terms of focusing. And isn't that what it's all about? Like trying to capture the best images possible when it makes it easier for you to focus. And I'm not talking about necessarily just like the auto eye focus, like you're just gonna put it on autopilot and fall asleep. I'm talking about just the fact that you can go corner to corner in a very quick motion to just, even if you're doing um, the single point focus, just you can, lock focus all around on the corner. Don't have to stop, recompose, move where you have a potential of, let's say if you're doing portraiture like myself where a model might move and you, you're shooting at F1.4 or something like that. You just have that razor thin depth of field where you just be out of focus and you realize maybe like the ear or something is in focus and the eye isn't. Oh, well, you're probably not going to miss as many shots even if you're not using the autofocus, even if you're just using the ability to lock that focus without having to recompose. So maybe back button focusing isn't even as needed on a mirrorless system. Uh, I still do it and I like back buttons. Anyway, um, so in summary, um, I will say like in the past, I considered upgrading with the DA10, too many megapixels, larger file sizes, didn't feel like it was worthy of the thousand dollar bump up over the D750. How about the Z6? Not another, there's only one card slot as well as 
a non-functional battery grip on the Z6. It just did battery. It didn't actually allow you, and again, I'm a portrait shooter, so I need that functionality of hitting the trigger here and, and going to town. Now the D780, another one. I thought about upgrading to that, to that one. No battery grip, no pop-up flash too, but I personally don't need that, but I can see where some people did. But the D780, no battery grip. Why, Nikon, why? Answer, please. Anyway, the Z6 II covers all of those bases dual card slot, battery, functional battery grip, uh, all the F-mount lenses with the adapter. <sighs> it's pretty awesome. So I gotta be honest, I'm going to be using the Z6 II going forward. I still have love for the D750. It's like a Pixar, like WALL-E. I'm not gonna toss it in the, in the trash heap. This, I created too many solid, amazing images with this that I'm gonna probably hang on to it for a little while. But um, the Z6 II is sort of the, the new kid in town and I'm really gonna go with it. So. Uh, Hopefully this video helped you. If you were considering upgrading, um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them below. I'll do my best to answer. Uh, if this video helped you, uh, please give it a thumbs up and give it a like. Um, and feel free to subscribe if you like this or any other videos that sort of share tips and tricks uh, from studio photography as well as in the Nikon world and, and others. So uh, thanks for watching and uh, have a good one.